Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This week, we turn our attention to the rise of China on the high seas by focusing on the People's Republic's claims to sovereignty over the area of the Pacific Ocean known as the South China Sea. Our guest is Marvin Ott, a senior scholar with the Wilson Center's Asia program and an adjunct professor and visiting research scholar with Johns Hopkins University. Welcome back to Dialogue, Marvin. Nice to have you here. Thank you. I want to ask you wh where your interest in the South China Sea as a, as a growing concern uh, originated. Well, f for someone with a little gray hair, uh, it's really kind of interesting to watch this. I've been interested in the China relationship with Southeast Asia, with this part of the world, the world to China's south, for a very long time, going back to the 1960s. Um, for the almost the entire period since the Vietnam War, keep in mind we made a huge investment of resources and lives in Vietnam in support of the proposition that this part of the world was absolutely vital to U.S. security. The war was over. And the Pentagon, the CIA, the NSC forgot about it. They had wanted nothing more to do with this part of the world. And that included the South China Sea. And if you and I had had this conversation five years ago, or you were looking for someone to talk about the South China Sea, you would have had a, you would have had a very hard time finding anybody. Nobody knew about it. Nobody was interested in it. The only people that paid any attention were the sort of maritime lawyers. And so what's happening now in the last sort of 24 months where this issue, I will argue, has actually moved to the geopolitical center of the world in the sense that the, the, the most pregnant conflict, potentially, lies in the confrontation and the clash of Chinese and American naval and air power. And the South China Sea has become the point at which those two powers, the rising power of China, the established power of the United States, are now clearly rubbing up against one another and the potential for it to become a much more serious situation and it's already serious is really quite large. The, the, the president talked about the pivot to Asia and uh, others in leadership have talked about that, certainly <clears throat> people in the military elsewhere. And yet if you looked at mainstream media, this still is an issue that doesn't get any attention or much attention. Why do you think that is? Well, as a country, we have been very preoccupied, everybody knows, Southwest Asia, Middle East, Persian Gulf. 9-11 uh, was a, an, a cataclysmic event for the American polity. And it, global war on terror, everything that followed from that, you know, created a huge magnetic pull into the region that we identified as kind of the source of the problem in terms of the global war on terror. Uh, during this period and prior to that, Southeast Asia was calm. It was successful, it was economically prosperous, it was doing well, American business was very active. Uh, whenever a region is not causing problems, it's gonna to tend to recede in terms of attention in Washington. Southwest Asia, Middle East, Persian Gulf, Afghanistan, that was causing problems. But we've talked about it, or I've seen some things that you've written and others have written for a, quite a bit of time now, as a, a potential crisis or an impending crisis. What has kept us, what has kept it at bay? I think what's kept it at bay, two things. One, the U.S. has been preoccupied elsewhere, so we have not focused. China, meantime, has been very focused on this region. But one thing that has kept it at bay is until quite recently, and I'll, uh, my my sort of moment in history will be April, uh, July 2010. I'll come back to that in a second. Okay. Um, until that point, South, uh, China had presented itself to Southeast Asia as a benign presence, a good neighbor, China's peaceful rise, and China had acted in support of that and had convinced the Southeast Asian countries that basically they and China were all engaged in a common enterprise of economic development. This was mutually beneficial. It was a positive sum game. We'll all get rich together. And, and that- And any notion of a territorial dispute was an undercurrent. Was an undercurrent and it was downplayed by the Chinese. And there's a wonderful phrase that former Paramount leader Deng Xiaoping would cite from Chinese history that translates in English as, bide your time, conceal your capabilities until you are ready to act. Mm. China was not ready to act in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s because it didn't have the naval power 
that it could de deploy onto the, to the seas to enforce the line, the famous nine dash line, which will appear, I think, on map two uh, in your uh, presentation here. Uh, which is in we fact... We can take a look at that now if we'll ask uh, the, the control room to show us map two and as you describe the line. Well, you'll and see... And for those listening on radio, we'll, we'll try to be explicit. Well, it, the South China Sea extends south of China along the coast of Vietnam. Uh, the southern rim, the southern portion of it touches Barneo and then in the east it touches the Philippines. It's an extensive body of water. There are multiple claimants amongst the Southeast Asian countries for territory in that sea. The U.S. has no claim. Uh, there are multiple atolls and uh, coral reefs and so on. Historically, the fishermen have been out there, but nobody else has been out there. Mm -hmm. So it has not been a subject of active uh, competition because no one was in a position to deploy a naval force. Uh, it was simply beyond everybody's capabilities, and that's where bide your time, conceal. By the time you get to 2010 or so, China is now building the capability, which they're demonstrating now on a daily basis, of deploying maritime enforcement and naval vessels in large numbers into the South China Sea. B uh, based on the, the map, uh, the, what is the traditional or historic maritime law? What does that indicate as far as who has claims to what? Well, that's a real thicket. And I'll, I'll to, to sort of reduce it to a couple of sentences. The traditional Chinese view, I think this is fair, is to say, look, we have a very long history and we have evidence from pottery shards and, and records in our, his, in our histories. Fossil records. Fossil, well, but you know, <laughs> you know, written records and so on. Sure. We know our people were out there. Therefore, this belongs to us. But China also signed the UN Law of the Sea as have the other countries of Southeast Asia. The UN Law of the Sea does not recognize the fact that you had pottery shards out there in, during the Song Dynasty mm -hmm. does not translate into any legal right. The UN Law of the Sea is about continental shells, it's about archipelagic principles, it's about whether you have a, 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 a historical occupation with a fresh water source. It's a complex set of metrics and the famous line that you see on that map that the Chinese have drawn on their, map, on their maps does not comport to the law of the sea. It has no standard. And on our map, that's the red line? That's the red yeah, line. Yeah, that's the big U. Yeah, if you're a So essentially they've claimed the entire They've claimed the whole thing. Now, there'll water. be some that will dispute that. I will argue that it is, it, the Chinese have made it very clear that they in fact claimed the whole thing. Uh, the problem is as signatories to law of the sea, the UNCLOS, that line has no standing. It, it is indefensible. And under, no other nation in the world is inclined to recognize that. And that's a big, it. exactly right, which leads us to, I'll, I'll sort of prefigure a conclusion here. China has laid out a claim that, which, by the way, incorp encompasses the busiest sea lanes in the world that move through the South China Sea, up from the south, the Malacca Straits, through the South China Sea, huge oil uh, tanker movement to China, to Korea, to Japan, across the Pacific to the U.S. And China is saying those sea lanes are inside our territory. There is no maritime country in the world that can accept that mm -hmm. position. And the, and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, now their number one trade partner is China, no That's longer right. the U.S. and Japan. Extremely dynamic and complex situation. And one of the factors is what you just mentioned. China, by virtue of its economic growth, its economic outreach into the region, free trade agreements, so very energetic campaign to build economic ties with Southeast Asia has become the principal trading partner and increasingly the principal investor in Southeast Asia, displacing both the U.S. and Japan. So if you're a country like the Philippines, your largest economic trade partner is China, but China directly threatens, as in, and in fact has taken control of, territory very, a very short distance from your shores out in the South China Sea that you regard as your own. So if you're the Philippine president, you've got an economic interest that pulls you one way, you've got a security interest, by the way, a alliance, security alliance with the United States, a security pull in the other in the other direction. And, and Secretary Clinton used the <coughs> terminology a couple of years ago in a speech of a maritime commons. It's completely the opposite of what China's claiming. Crucial point. When back to the sea lanes. 
S Secretary Clinton, when she met, my, I said July 2010 was my moment. Mm -hmm. She met at something called the ASEAN Regional Forum, a talk shop, 26 nations, China, Southeast Asians, everybody's there. Secretary Clinton, meetings in Hanoi with the approval of the Vietnamese, said, let me say something about the South China Sea. She made two points. One of them was those sea lanes are a global commons. They do not belong to any country. The straits through the, the sea lanes through the Strait of Gibraltar don't belong to Spain, they don't belong to Britain, they are a global commons. Now, Diplomacy 101, that's a very basic point. The Chinese, if the Chinese foreign minister, who was present, had said, yes, we understand that, no problem, mm -hmm. then almost all of the concerns we're talking about here would have vanished in a flash. Instead, the Chinese foreign minister basically went ballistic. He had a nervous breakdown in the meeting, he was shouting, and so on. What it revealed was that Secretary Clinton had struck a nerve and, and she had, a, you know, and the Chinese reacted with, you are trying to encroach upon our territory, you're trying to take away something that belongs to us. So, so, so the U.S. as an outsider trying to rally the locals against China, that was yeah, how it was viewed. That was how it was viewed. From I think Chinese that's a, perspective. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. That's a little strong. I mean, I don't think Secretary Clinton th thought she was rallying anybody. Well, right. but, My word, certainly but not. But you're her. quite right. From the Chinese foreign minister's point of view, that's exactly what was going on. So now the Chinese will turn, for example, to the Philippines and, and, and they have said this to the Philippine foreign minister. The only reason you're resisting our, in effect, our claims in the South China Sea near the Philippines is because you have the backing of the Americans. Mm. That's the only reason. Speaking of the Philippines, I'm surprised when you uh, started your timeline at 2010, you didn't go back to 1995 and Mischief Reef. Is that significant as a precursor to what we're talking about? It's very significant, but back to bide your time. Uh, in 1995-96, Philippines discovered the Chinese had built a military emplacement, an outpost, big concrete gun, gun emplacements and so on, on a atoll that is underwater most of the time at high tide. Uh, the Philippines didn't know it was out there. They discovered it after it had been built. Uh, complaints from the Philippines then to the Chinese. ASEAN, the 10 countries of Southeast Asia, took up the Philippine case, made a joint complaint to the Chinese. That became an important moment because at that point, it's pretty clear, the Chinese realized they had to be very careful how they played their position on the South China Sea. That had, that had in effect exposed their claim before they were ready to act. And so China responded not by dismantling what they did on this Jeff Reef, but basically saying, don't worry about it, just ignore it. We're, we're gonna be a good neighbor, we're gonna trade, we're gonna get rich, we're gonna be I have a, have a peaceful relationship, and you had 15 years of a very skilled diplomatic campaign and very effective persuading Southeast Asia that all was well, just don't pay attention to mischief reef, it's an anomaly. And then came the ARF meetings, and at the backdrop to that, for the Southeast Asians, was watching the military buildup occurring in China. It was so fast, so dramatic, and it, was, and it was designed to project power into the maritime domain, which then brings it up against the Southeast Asian countries, that Southeast Asian governments, which in the 90s and early 2000s, that had been inclined to and wanted to believe that China's intentions were entirely benign, were now starting to worry. And, and have, has China given nations of the world reason to worry? Uh, Specific um, reasons to worry as far no, as uh, the, the good neighbor policy versus no. something more threatening? Unfortunately, I think the answer is yes. I mean, if, you, if we were talking, say, 2007 or so, I would have said no, really not. The mm -hmm. Chinese have been really mischief reef aside on very good behavior. But in the last two to three years, we've had a whole sort of drumbeat of incidents. Vietnamese fishermen being arrested. Uh, oil companies that the Vietnamese wanted to invite into their economic zone to explore for oil being intimidated and pushed out in effect by the Chinese. Uh, attempts by uh, the Vietnamese again to uh, map the seafloor being Chinese boat comes and cuts the cables of the sonar arrays. Uh, the most recent incident, in some ways the most dramatic, involved the Philippines. Scarborough Shoals sits short distance off the Philippine coast it is within the 200 mile economic zone that the Philippines has under the law of the sea. The Chinese sent 
for fishermen, which were traditionally in there, but then followed by a flotilla of naval police, basically, uh, to force Philippine fishermen out. When the Philippines sent a patrol boat out, and there's practically no Philippine Navy worth mentioning, but they have one boat that we'd given them, so they sent that. Uh, there was a confrontation, and the U.S. became party to a sort of understanding, okay, we'll withdraw to sort of reduce the temperatures. The Philippines withdrew. The Chinese withdrew some of their vessels, but not the remainder. They kept those in place and put a cable across the lagoon, informed the Philippines that this now belonged to China, stay out, and that includes your fishermen. So the, the term creeping annexation, this has been one of a series of events like this, uh, is probably appropriate to describe this strategy. Does this, does this put nations like the Philippines or, or any of the others, Vietnam, does this put them in a position they don't want to be in of having to choose between the U.S. and China? Absolutely. They do not want to choose. Uh, which, but in st the Chinese, in effect, are forcing them to. Uh, it's really, for someone who tries to follow this from a fairly dispassionate strategic point of view, it's really pretty dramatic. The Chinese were so successful building their influence and presence up until about 2010, 2009. And since then, you've had this, this crescendo of incidents and statements, Chinese, we have indisputable sovereignty over the South China Sea. That means all you Southeast Asians who have claims out there, they're all invalid. The, this kind of thing has put the Southeast Asians very much on edge and has confronted them with a situation of they either acquiesce and basically be forced out of their positions they have in the face of Chinese power or they turn to the United States for protection in effect. They don't like it, but given a choice. And so you're now, and then that makes relevant the U.S. quote unquote pivot, the rebalance to Southeast Asia, out of Afghanistan, out of Iraq. We're now going to focus on this part of the world. We're going to start to deploy more forces. We're going to be more proactive. And, and, and we're now seeing an arena shaping up as a potential confrontation. And it's, in, and it's dangerous for all sorts of reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, in part because there are no ground rules. During the, the worst days of the Cold War, the U.S. Navy and the Soviet Navy had understandings about how they would handle when they, situations where they came up against one another to prevent something from getting out of hand. We do not have a set of understandings like that with the Chinese. We've tried to get it. We haven't got it. Military to military contact. Are there actual negotiations trying to achieve that, or is this just sort of? I, I can't speak. There. I can't say whether at this moment there are ongoing negotiations. Uh -huh. There have been periodic efforts. There's pr presumably a line of communication that's been set up. It doesn't work well, uh, and there's high frustration. I can tell you this: there's high frustration at Pacific Command, commander of the U.S. forces in the Pacific, in Honolulu, over their inability to talk with get an understanding with, communicate with the Chinese. And they are just terribly frustrated because they keep trying to do it and they keep getting nowhere. And so the potential, just to wrap, you know, wrap up this thought, for an incident is really very high. Imagine a scenario, Philippines and the Chinese again run up against one another. Philippine patrol boat, several Chinese patrol boats. Chinese captain's had a few drinks. He, he's, got a, he's got his blood up a bit, and he decides to teach the Philippine captain a lesson. He rams his boat. Philippine patrol boat goes down. Sailors are lost. Phone rings at the NSC from Manila saying, remember, we have a mutual security treaty between the United States and the Philippines. It says oh. that... It says that when our ships or aircraft are attacked on the high seas, you will come to our defense. We're waiting. Now, at that point, you earn your pay if you're a Pacific <laughs> Command and you're at the NSC in terms of how you respond. Well, uh, on that ominous note, Marvin, we're going to have to end this discussion. But thank you for a fascinating trip through the South China Sea. And if that moment occurs, we'll have to come back and talk about Let's it. Let's hope not. Let's hope not. Let's hope not. We'll find something, some other reason to speak. Thanks again. When we return, our genes, their secrets. That's the title of a New York Times op-ed on the Supreme Court's ruling in the case Association for Molecular Pathology v. Myriagenetics. We'll speak to the author of the piece right after this. <laughs>
The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. Eleanor Powells is a researcher with the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Wilson Center. She joins us to discuss attempts to patent human genes. This is quite a shift from South China Sea. Welcome, Eleanor. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. It is. It is, John. Thanks uh, for the invitation. The first thing I want to ask you about is the Supreme Court case that prompted your piece in the New York Times, Molecular Pathology v. Myriad Genetics. Uh -huh. What was up for grabs here? What was the court deciding? Yeah, on? so on June, on June 13, uh, the Supreme Court decided that natural DNA cannot be patented merely because it has been isolated from the human genome. So the question before the court was, can we patent human genes? And the answer is no, which is in line with uh, the position of the Obama administration. And this is actually an old story that started in the 80s, when for the first time a patent was granted on a genetically modified bacterium. Mm -hmm. And since then, for 10 years, the number of patents went, went from 500 to over 50,000. So that gives you an idea. So not only for policy wonks, but also for researchers and doctors all over the US, uh, the Supreme Court holding was kind of historic. It was a David and Goliath fight, a fight between those who advocate for genetic data sharing and the 100 billion biotech industry. So the immediate reaction was kind of enthusiasm from the research community, especially the cancer research community, and people who argue for open source biotech, and some deception for companies working on isolated genetic sequences. And was there a particular gene sequence that, that, this pr well, that prompted this attempt at a patent? Yes, the case before the court uh, involved an American company, Myriad Genetics, which got two patents in the late 90s for the human genes BRCA1 and BRCA2. And so mutation of certain mutation of these genes puts you at risk to develop breast and ovarian cancers. And this was m recently made uh, newsworthy by Angelina Jolie's decision yes, around this test. in the New York Times. Uh, so, so th you know, what, what happened uh, on, on, on this question of breast and ovarian cancer is that uh, on the basis of these two patents, Mehed became the sole provider in the U.S of a test to detect and analyze these mutations, a test for which the cost is over $3,000. Mm -hmm. No problem for Angelina, Angelina Jolie, as you mm -hmm. said, but it might be a problem for, for others. So in 2009, uh, this exclusivity was challenged by scientists and doctors who argued for open competition in genetic testing. And as you know, the Supreme Court heard the arguments, and uh, the patents have now been invalidated. But my opinion is that in this case, there is a bigger debate looming about trade secrets. And trade secrets different from patents? Yes, so um, patents expire. Trade secrets. Seven years? Is that the, the uh, lifespan of a patent? Yeah, it depends. Uh, it's different, okay. Yeah, it's different according to the case. According I won't make you be a lawyer here, so <laughs> don't worry about that. Yeah, um, but uh, trade secrets never expire. It's, it's another realm of, uh, of protection. So uh, my view uh, on the Myriad case is that um, none of the underlying tensions have actually been resolved. Um, in my research, I show that a more pressing issue is how companies keep genetic data as trade secrets. And that's, in a sense, what Myriad has been doing since 2005. So nearly one million patients have taken the Myriad test, and information on their mutations and their clinical data has been kept, for the most part, uh, out, of the out of the reach of the broader research community. Yeah. So the company has published some research and plans to publish more, as they say. And that's a good news. But the direct consequence co of, of Myriad being out of the public domain, that specific database, is that the broader research community cannot learn from the genetic and clinical data they've gathered over years. A and so if, if they attempt a patent, that becomes a matter of law, but trade secrets are not a matter of law. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a protection of, of you know, intellectual property, but it doesn't, it doesn't function the same way no. uh, that, that patent function. So at the, at the heart of this, uh, concerns from the corporate side that innovation will be stifled if a company can't through patents and other means, uh, protect its intellectual property in a way that it can profit from it. Mm -hmm. And then the concern on the other side is public health might suffer, research might suffer. Mm -hmm. uh, so w where are we now in that equation? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think the Supreme Court decision was mainly a pyrrhic victory in the sense that if companies cannot use patents, they might rely more heavily on trade secrets. And that could be a huge problem. You could see entire pieces of research becoming black box because of those trade secrets. Now, it doesn't have to be like this. 
I mean, there are several ways for uh, companies to benefit from the research in the biotech space while preserving cooperation. So another important part of the Supreme Court ruling is that uh, companies can actually patent complementary DNA, cDNA. And cDNA is an artificial construct that contains the same protein coding function found in natural DNA, but it has been stripped of the other functions. So in a way here, you patent uh, something for what it can produce, biofuels, chemicals, precursor for drugs. Uh, you, design, you design organisms so that they become little biofactories producing mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, added value materials that we need. It's a form of new manufacturing, molecular manufacturing. Then uh, in the future, you know, we can expect research researchers to develop and patent novel methods and applications based on their increasing understanding of the DNA code. So you could imagine patenting modified system for what they can do. And that's a significant innovation jump. You don't patent a gene for the information it contains naturally, but you patent it for what you can make it do uh, you know, for society. What's the landscape look like internationally as far as best practices, information sharing? Uh, is, there, is there general agreement in the research community of how to approach this issue? Uh, it's, it's really a, a booming issue. And you know, the defense line of companies is, is usually privacy. We need to protect privacy of patients. I, I totally agree. But we can work on privacy. We can design better informed consent. We can work on legal and software protections. We can just gather the most creative minds of this country and tackle that issue. Uh, while you know, genetic data sharing is essential because that's the only way we can actually design optimal treatments linked to the genetic makeup of our tumors and better understand cancer process itself. So recently, uh, a consortium of 69 organizations in thir 13 countries, including the NIH, push for the sharing of genetic and clinical data. Uh, and that's an effort that reaches you know, critical mass in a way. The only problem is that they need funding for developing uh, common technical standards and methods of classification. But when you look, when you ask researchers, uh, it's a booming issue and they want to be sharing. The answer might be life-saving. Life and the issue will only get larger and larger in our lives as the technology advances. It's Thanks Thank you. for joining us today, Eleanor. That's all for this edition of Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Until next week, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molesky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhcnetworks.org.